Well, hi everyone, it's uh, Pete here from the Paint Tool Kit and uh, doing another interview. Hey, I've got a really good uh, interviewee this morning and it's uh, Jane Middleton, who used to be the Chief Exec of the Charter Society of Physiotherapists. And good morning to you, Karen. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, really good. Hey, listen, thanks very much for uh, doing the interview. And um, I think, you know, we, I'm not going to go into uh, any physio stuff and whatnot like how oh, can you tell me about how this works and whatnot thank well, goodness for that be, <laughs> i thought it'd be interesting for uh the viewers and listeners to actually find out a little bit more about you karen you know before being a, a chief exec of the uh of uh, the cps so can i ask you, my first question really is what made you become a physiotherapist yeah well um we were talking earlier about our roots being in and around Romford um, in Essex. And um, I did um, one of those uh, uh, career questionnaires when I was 14, uh, uh, when I was at school in Hornchurch. And um, the, the, according to um, the answers I gave, one of the suggestions was to be a physiotherapist. Yeah. Um, of which I knew very little other than um, football and physios. Um, I'd I work, I'd done lots of voluntary work in the um, Red Cross um, and used to go and help out in hospitals and old people's homes and things like that. So I think I always had a sort of disposition towards the caring professions. Um, anyway, I then went and spent a week, I think it was half term, um, in the physio department at Old Church Hospital in Romford. Um, and they were good enough for me to spend a different day in a different part of the physio um, setup. And so I saw how sort of wide physio was. It wasn't just all about sports injuries. Um, and I just, something just really clicked. And uh, sort of from then on, that became what I was going to do. Um, it was interesting because obviously physio then and particularly now is very science based. And I was more um, interested in the arts at school. In fact, most of my teachers thought I was going to go and do French at university. So it was a, a major disappointment to them when I didn't. And I went and trained um in 82 at St Mary's Hospital, Paddington. And I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, that was my fourth application. Uh, I applied to four different hospitals before I got accepted because then uh, the course wasn't at a university. You were attached to a hospital. And I got turned down from the first three Um uh, but got in at Mary's and um, yeah, and, and went to train there for three years. So it was it was a bit of a combination of having done some voluntary work, what the career's advice was. And also, I mean, I've always loved football. My brothers have been uh, always played. My family is steeped in football. And and I think that there was definite sort of um interest in sports and and physio um and you know i started to sort of have this dream of being a physio at west ham united which has never materialized but you know nevertheless um yeah so that's how that's what got me started really well from that, that area i mean a lot of football was there uh, came around yeah Bobby Ward, yeah he was around yeah. the area and uh yeah Tony adams uh ray parlor i know i'm talking about trevor brookin yeah, I know. And uh, so I think the area, oh, he just passed away, didn't he? Um, uh, Terry Venables. Uh, yeah, he, he yeah, Dagenham. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the East London, or that part of Essex, of East London, or whatever. Yeah. Very, uh, a bit of a, um, well, popular for making football, uh, making good footballers. But so, yeah. So when, what, um, when, when you, so you did your training at St Mary's and you passed out as a physiotherapist. What, uh, did you go into any speciality or was it just general? Yeah, so, I mean, again, interesting from a physio point of view. So when I was training, um, I absolutely loved neuro. So people with head injuries, following stroke, etc. cetera. Um, 
And I hated, absolutely hated with a passion, outpatients and sports injuries and stuff. Um, but when I look back, it was all down to the people who were supervising me. Um, and this was sort of one of my first lessons, really, about how work is whatever work. It's primarily about the people um, and, um, you know, uh, the supervisor that I had in outpatients and sports injuries was just unpleasant um, and frightening. Mm. Um, and that turned me off the speciality. And the supervisor in neuro was patient, caring, helpful and inspiring. Um, but when I qualified, um you then sort of did three months in each specialty as a, as a, you know, then called a junior physio. And um, actually I found that I had two little patients to work in, in neuro, but, uh, you know, I needed to see improvement much quicker than you got in neuro. And, I, and actually um, I really enjoyed our patients and um, musculoskeletal hydrotherapy I really enjoyed and um so that was where I I specialized in um clinically and I sort of uh, moved to the London Hospital at Mile End um and focused there very much on being in charge of the outpatient department and the hydrotherapy but I actually only worked clinically for 10 years oh. um yeah I I so what else uh, so how did you where, where, how did the move come around in well, it was very interesting. I I always talk about the fact that when I was at school, you know, like you used to have prize givings. I never I never got a prize for being the best in anything. I always got like the, you know, worked hard prize or the progress prize or the, you know, the sort of prize that was for, you know, really having a go. And and when I was working clinically, I was a good physio, but I wasn't an outstanding physio. Um, and in those days, there wasn't such a thing as a consultant physio. Um, but I think even if there had been, I'm not sure it would have been for me. Because quite early on, what I started enjoying more was the teaching, was managing, was um, leading and sort of organising others Um and so I sort of went, I think, relatively quickly through into management posts. Um, and so 90, so I qualified in 85, 97, I stepped away from physiotherapy completely um, at Mile End and did a, um, uh, a project project manage a project looking at services for people with severe disability which wasn't a, a, an area of clinical practice I'd ever worked in and these were people in Tower Hamlets East London who had really severe disabilities and I started to learn a about how to manage big projects b how to engage with community um, I met people in their homes, pubs, clubs, wherever they were. And it was before the concept of a lot of what you've done of involving patients. It was uh, and it suddenly dawned on me. And I'll talk about one person in particular um, that actually an awful lot of the expertise rests with the patients, not not with the clinician, um, although the clinician does bring expertise. Um, and I remember the story that I remember most vividly is a lady who lived um, on the Whitechapel Road. I don't know if you know it up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she lived in a ground floor flat and she had multiple cirrhosis and she was severely disabled. She was in her early 40s. And she was what was described as housebound. Mm. So as a physio going to interview her about what services she would like, I was expecting her to say a wheelchair that, you know, can take me outside, um, more 
physiotherapy. Um, you know, I'd sort of got in my mind what she was going to need. And then I interviewed her and she said, you know what I really want? It's a window cleaner. And what she said was that every day she looked out at the Whitechapel Road and, you know, the market there. Yeah. And she watched people go back and forward. They wave, they, you know, chit chat through the window and all the rest of it. And she said, what really upsets me is my filthy windows. She never mentioned a wheelchair. She never mentioned more mm. physiotherapy, none of this. And um, I mean, as a physio, I, I mean, I couldn't just sort of leave it there, really. So I managed to get in touch with social services. There was no budget for window cleaning, but we, I think we reinterpreted a rule that meant, I mean, and it was eight quid a month yeah, at good. that point, you know, and you think about that compared to the cost of some mega wheelchair. And we got her her window cleaner. Yeah. And I suppose it was my sort of first real lesson in actually how much of healthcare is about what clinicians think is best rather than listen to the person in front of them first. And off, obviously we have expertise, but the expert in that person's life is that person. Yeah. Um, and so that was a real moment in my professional life where I decided in my own mind that I would never do anything again, whether it clinically, managerially, that wasn't with the patient yeah. or the person uppermost. Um, do you know what? That moves to my ear, that is that because, you know, when I, when I talk to people like myself, really, and um, I say, I always say to them, what, what do you think you need to get back on track like, you know? And do you know what is the, the you know, or which, what's your goal? It, and it's not, um, it's not about uh, more meds and, um, operate more treatments and stuff like that it's they want to get back to doing things simple stuff like just walking yeah. around the garden going for a walk yeah, with the kids yeah. And stuff like that and and that you know the, and the thing is i think when with people with uh long-term health conditions it's it's about the, the things that we've had to stop doing or put on put on hold because of the symptoms we're getting etc like that and all we really need is a bit of a you know, some simple ideas really on how we can get back on track, you know, with a set of goal and action plan and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in a way you was uh you was having that, that, that awakening. I mean that's uh, it was and it was uh, and an awakening sounds melodramatic, but it really was like that. Mm. Um and and I really had to reflect on my 10 year career up until that point. You know, had I been doing things that made me feel good or was I really listening to the, to patients and, and doing what they needed? Um, you know, even to what I chose to go and do extra training in, you know, so there was some techniques that I, I um, went and did some training in without getting too technical that were very, were manipulative on the spine. Um, and they were like sexy end of physio. I mean, probably there's no evidence for them and, and you, you probably shouldn't do them anymore. But at the time, they were the thing to do. Hmm. But actually, most of my patients in Tower Hamlets contraindicated those treatments, i.e. You, you couldn't use those treatments on them. Hmm. So why was I going off and learning about them if at the end of the day I was never going to be able to use them for the people who I was meant to be serving. And I think that this is another word that I would use that I learnt around that time. And, and we talk a lot about the National Health Service, but we forget what the word service means. And um, so it was um, those few years when I was sort of, listening to person after person about what they needed from rehab in the community. Um, it was transformational for me as a human being and as a physiotherapist. 
and and it shaped the rest of my career so you know what i did after that was um present to the board the findings of the project and what i did was bring in patients to do the presentations wow. and i mean it was so powerful because yeah. you know it's really hard to say no to patients, really hard. And um, we'd practiced, we'd rehearsed, and we had this big board meeting, and it was just great. So as a result of that, I set up a community rehab service in Tower Hamlets, oh, well, which was patient-led. So on all the interview panels, it was patients. Good. Um, it was it was just something completely different. And and then, of course, now it's, you know, there's lots of places that do that. And, and you know, that the whole phrase, nothing about me without me came in and, and all of that. But it gave me uh, a bit of a profile nationally, which which then sort of enabled me. I started speaking at conferences and things about what, you know, we call the social model of disability and about empowering patients uh, rather than hold the power ourselves as clinicians. Um, and so, so I did that for a number of years in Tower Hamlets. And then um, I stayed in Tower Hamlets next, but I went into community nursing. Um, and I managed community nursing for about three or four years, which was really hard work, health visiting, district nursing and school nursing. But again, I think, you know, that that working in the community, mm. you know, you're going into people's homes. It's not your not your space. It's not your hospital, your gym or, you know, your rehab unit. You're going into people's homes and and it's just a completely different dynamic um so that was really hard work managing nursing as a physio um and there was a lot of reaction about me being a physio um and not a nurse but i had loads of you know i had 250 nurses i didn't need another nurse really so what's so so you got your listen say you're saying like on this journey when so what what part um how did you how did you get so did you did someone approach you about becoming a chief exec of the uh, well so so all this time I'd had a bit of a love hate relationship with the CSP I'd been a I'd been a trade union uh, representative of the CSP when I first um, qualified and that and that brought out in me I can't bear unfairness or injustice. And, and so I did some training and that was really good. And then um, after I managed nursing, I went to the Department of Health and I became the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer for England. And well, I did a, a deputy job and then the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer. So I worked for the government, worked for three prime ministers. And um, what and I, I really started getting involved in health policy much broader than physio. So all the allied health professions, mm. OT, speech, the whole lot, all 14 of them. And the reason I had this sort of love-hate relationship with the CSP was that what was clear to me was that the way healthcare was going in this country, the way uh, people were living with long-term conditions, physios and the CSP should have a much higher profile. Um, and, and yet we weren't anywhere to be seen, really. Um, and so that's what I used to get very frustrated with the CSP. Mm. And then in 2013, um, the, uh, the previous CEO retired and the job came up. I mean, never in a million years did I imagine that I'd apply for that job. Um, you know, I've never actually, you know, there's never really been a plan in my life uh, career wise. I I've just gone for jobs that I thought I could make a difference mm -hmm. in. Um, and, and I just suddenly thought rather than keep banging on about how hopeless they are, I need to go in and see if I can have a go at, at changing things. And so... That's why I applied in 2013 and started in 2014. And I mean, it was my first CEO job. 
Um, and and it was interesting because I was the first woman CEO, the first physio who'd been a CEO at the Charter Society of Physio. And um, and it was really hard. There was a huge amount of change to to do there. I mean, this still is. I mean, organizations have to keep evolving and keep changing. But yeah, that's how that's how I got there, having been at the Department of Health and had a national profile or international profile. Uh, in many ways, I travelled the world on behalf of the department. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I decided that lots of people said to me when I went to the CSP or, you know, it's a downwards move or a sideways move. And I said, I'm not really interested in up, down or sideways. I just want jobs that I think I can make a difference in. And and that's why I had a go at the CSP one. So to, to wind things, I tell you, uh, I mean, I, your journey, I love it. I'm, I didn't know, well, obviously, I didn't know this. Been this first time yeah. I've ever, ever spoken. Yeah. And I did, what you said about the um, about the CSP not going in the right direction, and um, you said, well, instead of um, banging it, banging it, you know, on the head from the outside, get in. And I always remember a little saying years ago: the, the first person that makes complains about the team makes it next week. Yeah. yeah. So it's actually yeah. getting in there and, and getting involved. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So you've done your tour of duty, and um, yeah. you're you're putting your feet up. I'm. I, I don't want to know what you're <laughs> thinking. You're gonna have a chill out approach time now to get you know because I've I've not been in that sort of situation with like the, 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 the you know where you've been up there in your yeah echelons and stuff like that. But I know when I left the NHS, like you know, my head was still whirring, you know, in that yeah. sort of process for for quite a few months, really. But um, have you got a lot of things planned, like a few breaks, holidays, and whatnot? Yeah, I've got 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 a few got a few holidays planned. Um, off to Cornwall in a couple of weeks, then skiing. Um, uh, so yeah, got got some nice holidays planned, which I know I'm very privileged to be able to take. Um, and um, I I mean I'm sort of backed right away from the CSP because I think it's very important to give the new yeah. chief executive yeah. space, get on with it. Um. And let him do his thing. Um, I trained as an executive coach about three years ago, and I've been doing that pro bono, uh, coaching senior leaders um, in the health service, but more recently outside the health service as well. And um, I really enjoy that. And I think I can make a difference um, with people giving them space and time to work out solutions to the issues they're dealing with. And I think you know, maybe in the middle of the year, I'll pick that up more formally. We'll see. Um, I At the moment, I feel, uh, I think I said to you earlier, I feel like I'm decompressing a bit from it. Um, chief exec jobs of any organisation are full on 24-7. You know, you might have holidays, you might have weekends, but really you don't. Um, and so I'm just taking time just to sort of come out from beneath the, the workload really um and um just see a bit more of my friends and family um a bit more west ham which i could uh, uh do without good. right now it's not really uh, helping I'm the stress me. levels we, we promised yesterday we wasn't going to yeah uh, oh yeah, god i mean i i, I know i say my second team i guess like i'm a guna like as people know but uh because well, I have to live with Guna, Aguna, so he, you can imagine. Oh, your husband's a Guna, is he? Yeah, so you can imagine what it was like on Sunday. <laughs> Horrendous. I mean, I mean, I, I have to be honest. I haven't. Uh, there, I've got a lot of hammers friends around here, and I've not said anything because I've done when I. It's like putting petrol on the fire, but it was a good result yesterday. I hope we don't get too too carried away with it. Listen, Karen, it's been fantastic talking to you. And, um, Thank you. I'm, I'm interested to find out what, what your next steps are as, as we go along. Yeah. And Thank uh, you so much, Pete. Can I say, um, can I, can I say that on behalf of people living with pain, people live with long-term conditions, can I say thank you for your service? Because You're welcome. Because of it, you have made massive, massive difference to a lot of people's lives. So on behalf of them, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. It's kind of you. Take care. See you now. Bye. All right. Bye.